All right, well, hey, everybody, I'm John Snodgrass. Uh, we're here at SHOT Show 2018, and welcome to the first Loophold Core Insider podcast. Uh, I'm here with uh, re Sergeant Major Retired Kyle Lamb um, and Master Sergeant Retired Buck Doyle. Um, so got a lot of experience here. Today we're going to talk about, uh, you know, some of the market trends going on, some long-range shooting, and, and just kind of sit back and talk about uh, where things are going with Loophold and, and how the market's going. Pretty exciting, man. We're here, and I think what's super exciting for us is the uh, this Mark V. Holy cow! Yeah, yeah. big T's. I've been waiting for it. I'm glad uh, got to play with it the last couple of months, and um, it's. Uh, I'm just I'm just kind of surprised you guys were able to take. You guys did all the improvements you've done. Yeah. I mean, I read in the short amount of time, uh, but I'm. I'll, I'll regress a little bit and we'll get in there. <laughs> yeah, we'll, I'm, I'm really excited. We'll, awesome. we'll start digging into that and I'll, I'll kind of start putting in the shameless product promotions. But, uh, <laughs> so a little bit, I mean, obviously you guys have, have been places and seen a lot of things. Just go ahead and, and uh, for the people who, who may or may not know, just a little bit of background from each of you and, um, you know, where you came from, what you're doing now, and you, you both have training programs set up and, and you guys are out there doing business and rocking the world. and. Just well, let us a little know, a, a, know a little bit about what you guys have got going on. I'm an old Army guy. Uh, started out in the 82nd, went to SF, and after that went to one of our special mission units. In that unit, I was lucky enough to go to the SODIC course, which is the, the sniper course that they send special ops guys to in the Army. And I, was a, I thought I was a shooter when I went to that course, but I learned so much, and I got so interested then in long-range shooting, and I came back to the unit and became a... Uh, a sniper, as well as uh, worked my way up to a sniper team leader, and then eventually ended up with first special forces group as a sniper instructor, running a level one SODIC course out uh, out west for uh, a year. And I don't know, it's just something I've always enjoyed. And growing up, I thought I kind of knew what I was doing, and then I joined the military, and I realized that I had no clue about long what really long range was. Growing up in South Dakota, I thought I knew, but right, you know, we learned so much in the military, and it's. Uh, I guess it keeps kind of festering. I don't teach a lot of long-range classes just because um, I do a lot of more carbine-type stuff, mid-range-type mm -hmm. stuff. But it's something that when I get a chance to go out and do it, I do it a bunch. I know, Buck, you do a whole lot more long-range stuff. Oh, that's a good that's, – that's funny. Um, we've got to define what is long-range. But yeah. we'll get back to that in a minute. But uh, basically, as far as me in the background, um, retired Jarhead uh, did uh, 21 and a half years in Marine Corps. Uh, majority of that time was all in the recon arena. Uh, served first recon battalion, first force recon, and uh, helped stand up uh, portions of the MARSOC element. Deployed uh, my last deployment in 2010 with uh, ALF Company of uh, first uh, Raider Battalion, I guess they're calling it now. Uh, during that time, uh, went to a lot of schools, had a lot of opportunities. And I went to sniper school a little late in my career just because I wanted to have that uh, capability to get the boys the missions. So if the senior enlisted has that uh, uh, understanding and uh, uh, credibility under his belt, to get the boys out there outside the wire doing work. During that time uh, in the recon reconnaissance field, we always had we always uh, favored magnified optics on our on our carbines, mm -hmm. M4s, whatever. So. Uh, shooting that mid-range or long-range, however you want to define it, has always been something we had to be good at doing and had to learn and have appreciation for those types of optics. Um, after becoming a sniper, um, getting my guys trained, go overseas my last part of my career, uh, I really fell in love with uh, the different variables that go into being successful in shooting long-range. Uh, after I retired, a contract with the DOD, I was advisor, so I got to jump in with the different uh, units your soft elements, would be uh, SEALs, SF, whatever. And uh, during that time, kept getting involved in long-range shooting. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, like Kyle, I kind of consider myself a, a carbine guy. Mm -hmm. um, I use magnified <coughs> opposite, but um, I do teach long-range. Um, but a lot of times it's to the hunters that come in and or some military types. Well, and it's interesting because uh, I mean, you and I have talked quite a bit and just – We'll keep bringing the Mark V up, but a lot of the way that you approach your guns and how you set sure. them up and how you train went into that Mark V, right? Because sure. we, we yes, talked sir. probably 
way more than you wanted to talk to me about about the scope and how we were how we were bringing it along but um, and that's what makes that's what's awesome about this is he's the guy he's the guy on the ground that's shooting the gun Mm -hmm. let's talk to the guy that actually is going to use the scope definitely in that situation versus let's make something and then find customers for that how about we go get the customers find out what they want and then let's make the product and i think that's uh capability what that capability do you want as a shooter bone. exactly you know and my my background prior to the military was a lot like yours right grew up in a western state out in oregon family right. had a cattle ranch so you know you you'd go out and you'd see stuff and you'd take pop shots and stuff you know four or five hundred you know you were a long range shooter right? yeah because you were just <laughs> launching lead out or there, long you range know? wounder as <laughs> yeah it, there, as there's that too man there's you could probably you know mine our our ranch for lead from, from me running around out there but then you know when i got in the military it was totally different than what you guys went through i, I got lucky and got on the shooting team so nice yeah. um, but back in those days you know it was very regimented we shot across the course we shot nra there wasn't a lot of the um the more combat oriented stuff going on that there is now and that's that's kind of taken what you guys went through in your experiences and, and talking about where what we're seeing happening right now because there's been a huge growth in the interest in, in long distances and long range shooting and precision and accuracy um, and that's that's kind of you know how do we take it to the next level well with, one with thing the you said John was you said you shot across the course the NRA type shooting I got to tell you to me that is some of the best training that you can ever do for a long range shooter if you start with those basics I went and shot at Camp Perry mm-hmm. you know across the course like that. Iron sights. I mean, it's awesome. It was a gr- it yeah. was a great way to train, and then take it to the next level with whether it's something in the military or as a civilian. Uh, yeah, the trends that are going on right now. I think it's uh, some is good, some is bad. I, I, you can't. I can't keep up with it because um, the the uh, see. I came. I got the acronym wrong. PRS, PSR. PRS. I okay. think it is. Yeah. Precision I know rifle about series. It. Yeah. So, yeah. but I got a lot of guys that come to my classes that do that type of uh, shooting and competing. And I find myself, you know, like, wow, you guys are really doing this and doing it this way or whatnot with the um, with those long shots, the, uh, the obstacle courses and all that stuff. So um, there's a lot of things going on out there that are invo- that, that's involving long-range shooting, but everyone's applying it differently. And I mm-hmm. think this is great because at the end of the day, I may not want to do exactly what you're doing, but I may take a piece of that pie yeah. and apply it to what I'm doing. So I got a lot of competitive shooters coming to my tactical classes for, a, for one reason, to learn a different aspect of shooting, learn right. wins, learn whatever, to go back to their genre of shooting and, and take it to the next level or be a better shooter in their, in their field. I think that PRS is the best thing that's come around because if, we, if, if somehow we can migrate that to get more military guys involved, right. shoot these crazy positions because – you know, and that's one thing ac- across the course. You get to that point, you're like, okay, I, this is awesome, except for you're never going to shoot from the prone in combat very rarely. <laughs> Amen. You know what I mean? No, no, no. You're, you're we ta- right. talk to these classes. We go, okay, you guys are snipers. How many of you guys have shot somebody from the prone? And they'll be, you know, maybe 20%. Right. So what is that position off a rooftop, kneeling or whatever? And I, I think it's. But it goes back to what you're saying, the basics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, NRA, uh, when you go through those course, rifle courses, they teach you the basic positions to shoot. Okay. From there. You go out into the real world or your your operational environment. So if you're hunting in one part of the world and you're dealing with boulders, you're dealing with uh, deadfall, and that's where you're going to be shooting your prey. Right. That you need to look at those positions for what they are and practice that a lot. It makes no sense to go and then zero your rifle in a prone and stay there all day shooting. You know, whatever you're going to shoot all day. It's zero it. It's good. Now get your butt in the positions you're going to be more likely shooting your prey on and practice. That should be your game. Yeah. So when they come out to me, and I'm like, uh, unfortunately, I'm a one-man show, so a lot of time I take my pictures is when I can safely do it, and they're all in a prone. But they're out there, they shoot a prone, okay, we're done, let's go. They're like, oh, don't even buy pods? I don't know, you tell me. We're about to go over and shoot off some boulders. Yeah. We're going to go over here and shoot off the side of a cliff. Up and down angles. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. Perception. All those things that you think, you know, you, you take for granted hits you in the face when you're out there and a lot of these guys that go on these hunts, I mean, I'm not a, I'm, you know, I'm a big hunter like Kyle is, but when they tell me the money they're getting ready to spend and how far they're going to shoot and what they've done to prepare for that, I'm like, bruh, <laughs> you're we, setting yourself up a failure. We've we got a lot of work to do. We were just in Wyoming a couple of weeks ago hunting elk, cow elk, and I shot my cow elk at 450 yards from a standing position mm. with a tripod and a set of shooting sticks propping up the back of the gun and it was as 
as good as a prone position. Now right. it changes your zero, and I think that's something that a lot of these guys, you know, because the gun is able to move a little bit more. But, you know, I went into that going, man, I've shot this gun out to 525 yards with this setup. I'm right. good. Actually, I think we shot out to 800 with that setup. We went prone and shot out to 1,100, but with an AR, so I'm comfortable with nice. that. You know, that's what I like to hunt with sure. and, and do a lot of shooting with. Um, that one I had one of your VX6s on. It was their their gun. So that was a lot of fun, you know, and, and I think some guys think, oh, it's just going to be prone. And No, there's a lot of education that goes into it, and, and that's what I like about when you, when you, when you take the, the shooter, it would be a hunter, tactical guy, take him out, zero rifles, alpha prone now, let's talk. Let's, let's talk. How are you going to apply this tool mm -hmm. in your world? And then from there, you start to understand, okay, what scope am I going to need? What kind of reticle am I going to need? Um, am I going to have time to turn knobs? What, the variable power, what's got to be on the scope? There's, there's the questions that need to be asked prior to going out there and uh, applying your shooting skills because those questions, those answers are going to lend you to figuring out my training, what kind of training do I need to go out there. Um, the fundamentals are going to be a requirement, but then the techniques, the tools, sticks. Some people say, well, I just need a one stick and then a tripod, that's it. I mean, when I go, I have everything. Just because, like you said, what you're, what you're talking, the setup you had, yeah. you had tripod and, and bipod, that's not typical when you see people out there shooting. That's like, i got to figure this out. But if you don't train to that level, you're not going to have that knowledge base. Yeah, and that was so when I, when I made the reference to you and how you set up your guns going into a lot of the product development sure. that we've been working on, and that was what really drove some of that is, you know, what do you need? Right. Let's, let's make sure we get the, the foundation of, of what we need. And if it, if it doesn't help get the shot and it doesn't help you be accurate, then, then let's just throw that out the window and, sure. and focus on what's going to get the job done. Right. Um, so that's kind of the, the approach that we took when we were going back and forth on the, on the development on the Mark V. So um, really, really tried to keep it focused on that, those basic needs, but having all the tools that you're going to need when you get out there to, to get the job done. Right. I think one thing folks are going to look they're going to look at this Mark V. It, <laughs> it is so tiny and it's so clear. The parallax is so easy to adjust. I mean, it's something that we've been waiting on for these. I'm a gas gun guy. I love gas guns. I, when I hunt overseas, I've got to take a, you know, bolt gun. a bolt gun or a blazer, which I like the blazer. This last trip, we shot a bunch of baboons at extended range with a 6.5 Creed, more like that. Um, but ultimately, I want it on a gas gun, and that's the perfect, the perfect scope that'll go on a gas gun. You can carry it up and down the hills if you're a military guy. If you're a hunter, you can carry it in a scabbard because it's small. I mean, it's got the lock. It's just so, it's, it just fits that whole that whole world. Like the PRS guys, I was going to say something about PRS versus the hunter versus the military guy. I think PRS is closer to the military than it is to hunting because in hunting, I think you can learn a lot from PRS. And then when you go to hunting, what happens is you only have one target, which makes it easier, unless it's baboons or jackrabbits or something that's crazy that's moving right. around but in reality in the military you're gonna have multiple targets to worry about so field of view matters and how much you dial in and all this stuff whereas for the hunter hopefully they're kind of looking at one animal so you can get away with you know you can get away with having uh, a vx6 because you're going to focus in on one critter and it doesn't right. you don't need to see you know if i dial this back to this power for my field of view of being able to do my holds or whatever so i think it's a kind of a this this fits really both yeah. markets though. A absolutely, it's the the weight is the big thing for for both my. You, you got a lot of guys that are a lot of guys that shoot PRS are hunters also. A lot of guys that are in the military they also like to hunt. So it is a great crossover, right? It's got the lightweight, um, it's got the clarity, everything that you need. If you want to take that tactical rifle, your AR, and you want to go out and hunt, it's I mean that is the scope to to put on it. Tw is it twenty four? The the three point six to eighteen is twenty six ounces. Twenty six ounces. Yep. That, that's yeah. nothing. It, that yeah. is nothing. Yeah, I it's mean, sig significantly lighter than most of the competition that's oh, out there. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And, and on your point, just see, it, just applying the scope. So, well, a lot of times when I train, well, training with guys, it's, whether it be hunters or military, is just tracking, tracking your target. Uh, there's no static targets in when you hunt or you're, you're military. They're always moving to some degree, and they'll move close, far, back and forth. But the ability to sit there and track, and I'll go. One of my most favorite parts on the Mark V is the throw lever. I'm sorry. The internal throw lever. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because you can be in a position for a long time, be tired, gloves, whatnot. But when you can put your hand up there and just move that variable power back and forth, as simple and as silly as that sounds, 
that to me is a huge part of that scope that I like, and it's internal. So I'm not putting some extra on there, it's on there. Um, but when tracking targets back and forth with your variable power going back, I mean, that's huge in training, and we just don't do it a lot. Um, and there's plenty of examples out there, especially if you've been down range, but I know guys that come back and tell me their stories, like, the, the, and I was south in Texas uh, with a buddy of mine, and we're tracking uh, mule deer. And uh, 500, 20 minutes later, it's at 800. Then it's back down to 400. Then it's yeah. back out at 800. He's not, we're not taking a shot because we don't have the shot yet. Right. But um, the ability to track with the, going up and down in variable power, but also, like you said, Kyle, the, um, the, the focus parallax adjustments are a lot clearer than, 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 than the other scopes. And, and that's a huge improvement. It's, and I have old eyes now, so when I was younger, I wouldn't really be focused on it, but now it's, it's, it's paramount. <laughs> that, that dang thing works. Cause so, I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the things is, is we were working on. Is like we got to make those numbers bigger. And, and the people that are listening right now don't know, but we were having this conversation and we're all sitting around the table and, and everybody's pulling out their reading glasses. And, and it's like I felt like I was, in, you know, it, like I was one of the gang because <laughs> I was like, I didn't, I didn't, I'm sitting here trying to, trying to look and, and trying to see. And then Kyle pulls out his glasses and Buck pulls out his glasses. I'm like, hey, can I borrow those? But uh, that, then that is one of the things going back to the functionality of the scope is, right. is trying to, we made the numbers bigger. We made the clicks more distinct. So if you can't see the numbers, you know, it's, I there, got a there's crazy a lot of question, functionality. Question that. for you on that. So are you doing that scope in, in MOAs as well? We will. So, okay. so this, this initial introduction, everything's milliradians front focal and middle radians. As the family grows, and we haven't really talked about what the Mark V is, right? So this is going to be an entirely new family of scopes for Leupold. Um, the first two models, we have a 3.6 to 18 and a 5 to 25. So they're both five times zoom erectors. Yep. Um, and again, like I said, it's, it's, these are the first two in an entire family. So we've got a lot more stuff coming. Uh, the initial offerings are all front focal plane and middle radian, but we're going to have some, some second focal stuff coming. We'll have some MOA stuff coming. Uh, the the family is going to continue to grow and evolve. What, what are you seeing in your classes? Are you seeing these civilians that come, are they sporting mills or minutes? Mills. Uh, a lot of my classes, we focus on trimmer 3 reticle, which oh, okay, provides okay, yeah. in there. So a lot, a lot of it's on, on mills. I do have some guys that want to come in with MOA, have no problem with that. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's mills. And uh, you get a lot of the tactical uh, style shooters, so they'll come in with mills just because the military uses a lot of the mills now. I think everyone's really in the military has gone to mills almost. I'm yeah. Pretty yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I believe but, um, so. The, uh, but mostly mills. Mostly mills. The um, 3.6 to 18. That right there, I, I'm very excited when I got it. And um, it was, I think, I think I had like three or four, I had it for three or four classes before the SHOT Show. And um, it walked off twice. Uh People are gonna love the damn scope. Yeah, it, 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 I mean it's it's lighter. Well, now if folks don't understand, walk off doesn't mean like <laughs> it drifted <laughs> and didn't hold at zero. It means that some dude in your class tried to steal the scope, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be nice about it, but it did walk off. And uh, um, but things don't walk too far. Uh, <laughs> from the range, <laughs> but it does. But there's but a lot of holes in the desert, right? <laughs> oh yeah, and that river runs pretty hard in the spring. Um, it's it's going to do real, real well. I love it. Um, like I said, the, uh, the 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 focus the focus parallax knob. I mean, I can't I can't stress enough how important um, you guys improving on that is because it, it's just it's phenomenal, mm -hmm. um, and it's the ability to track uh, with the scope. A lot of we do. I do a lot of moving targets. Um, we get a lot of mirage when the winds that come in. Uh, it changes up the mirage and be able to see that and be able to understand what what you have to do as a shooter to engage a target when you have those variables change on you. Um, people understand it's, it's how how well you can see them, and if you don't have clarity in that scope and be able to adjust from different ranges and then on target because it's just not the target you worry about. You also worry about the foreground background target mm -hmm. too for your feedback. Yeah. And that thing just moves it just moves phenomenally and you can see all that information cuz at the end of the day if you don't get the shot the first time the information you have to make that follow up shot is all you got. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, you guys did a great job with that. So yeah, I think one, you know, knowing what Buck does on the range and I'm not trying to 
steal your thunder here, I but ahead, I think that what I like about his training is it's not – I don't think you're a science guy. I think you're no. an application guy. Yes, sir. And I think with, with what we're trying – and I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. I'm good with all these programs and phones and computers and – Kestrels and all that stuff, but in a real gunfight, hey, that's awesome if that target is way, way out there. But when it's at that mid range, you're faster to shoot and miss and shoot and hit than you are to dial, dial, think, dial, and then you're getting shot at, and then finally you shoot and miss anyway. So you might as well, you know, you might as well make it happen. And I think with that scope, that's what's nice. You, it's it's so clear that. Oh, you can make it happen no, quickly no, and dial yeah. quickly and yeah. hold quickly or whatever whatever technique exactly. you're using. No, and you're absolutely right, Kyle. Just, um, I'll, I'll even say this. Um, I go out and I spot for a lot of hunters when they go out there to help them out. And I tell them every time, once you know, we know the range, you got the shot, if you hit and or miss and your prey is moving, you have to know where to hold. And you're not pulling on the range finder. We're not doing any, any kind of math, whatnot. So you have to know if you're holding X mil, whatever, if it moves beyond that, what are you holding? If it moves closer, what are you holding? <clears throat> whatever you guess at that time, based off that information, what you see is what you get. So don't, don't look at your impacts and your feedback and debate it. It is what it is. Adjust from that. Yeah. You know, like you're saying, you have to be able to shoot. See what you see the information, and if you don't have a clear scope, you're not going to be able to see it. Yeah. Not, not accurately, and then you can re-engage. And um, that's the reality of it's not a gunfight, but it's hunting. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I, I, I've seen yeah, I think it matters more in a hunting situation because in a gunfight, quite honestly, if, if we don't kill the guy, we're we're really not worried about that. No, we're right. really not. I mean, you're trying to put bullets into somebody. That's fine. You wound them, they run off. Whatever. You don't lose a lot of sleep over that. If you shoot an elk out there and it runs <laughs> off, you're going to be a sad camper, you know, because that's, I mean, that's one. Especially you don't want to. runs away from yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Because you're well, like, oh, how long is that going to take? And they always run straight down to the bottom of the yeah. canyon, right? Uh, but that's, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. So to, you brought up that point. I think the PRS series does that, or the, you know, these, these precision matches where everything's accuracy in time, right? And you've right. got targets at different distances. And to your point, Buck, it's you shoot and miss, and that that is where you make your correction from right. at that time, right? You don't have time to mess around. You get all the information yeah. right there in the world. It, exactly. Everything's right there. Are, are you guys seeing the evolution? Because, like I said, I know it's, it's been a long time since I was in the military and, and did shoot, and everything was very regimented, and, and we had the same, you know, everybody shot a Model 24, uh, you know, for yeah, yeah. decades, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, um, that, that thing, I didn't think it was ever going to go away. I, I don't think it has, but... Uh, are, are you guys seeing, since you're, you're training the military, you're training hunters, you're, you're, you're seeing both sides of it, what's, what's driving what, or are they both kind of driving together to, to the future of what the long-range market's going to do? You mean is the military and civilians driving together? Right. I, I think they are. Yeah, they have to. Okay. Yeah, I, I think they are. And I think if you look at um, really in the past, innovation has always come from the civilians it's normally not come yeah, the military from military doesn't make anything yeah right. you know they don't uh, uh go back to uh, red dots on a carbine that didn't come from the military that yeah. came from that came from guys like jerry barnhart and rob latham guys that were shoot you know doing things like that right. and then we realized how or john shaw you know going even ba farther back i think it's still kind of driven by civilian population and probably more importantly is the military guys if they're not at work i would call them a civilian right you know because if they're at work they have to shoot what they're issued right when they go home and you got a guy that shoots three gun or he shoots prs or he shoots whatever he can he's a civilian at that time so i would say that's when we're making those leaps and bounds look at what gas guns do right now oh yeah i mean gas guns are shooting we've got six millimeter Creedmoor, 6.5 Creedmoor, uh, what's 260. that, 224 Ack, or not Ackley, but uh, Valkyrie, the, the new Valkyrie, cartridge. Yeah, yeah. I haven't yeah. shot one of those. I have but not. I, have, I got a so barrel. So, yeah, so much cool in. stuff. No, uh, and that's the, that's the thing. You're, Kyle's absolutely right. Military, innovate. How about the military, I'm sorry, civilians innovate, get everything going. Military will come up with ideas. And as, and as companies like Liverpool that, We'll take those requirements from the military, and then you guys build things, mm -hmm. okay, based off capabilities they want, so, right. so on and so forth. What I'm finding is the capabilities that a hunter has and a, and a, and a rifleman has are pretty much the same. 
Um, how fast can you s know the distance of the target and put rounds on that target effectively? I think uh, a, a soldier and, and, a, and, a, and a hunter wouldn't argue those points. Um, how you go about doing that, I think uh, everyone's coming together with your reticles. You got reticles coming from your competitive shooting world and hunting world. The military said, well, that makes sense. I mean, if you're in a gunfight, turning knobs is not an option. Right. If you had a great position, breaking that position with your non-firing hand and your firing hand, the dial up or down is not an option. Yeah. So a lot of these reticles are holdover reticles. I mean, with your Horus or whatever, whatever's out there. When you, when, you, when you have those different aspects of shooting come together, you're going you're gonna to have a combination. You can't even track who's innovating who. and You can't do that anymore because we'll leave this podcast now, go downstairs, and I'll walk over there, and I'll see something like, oh, I would never thought about that. You got some squirrel hunter that just brought an uh, application or capability to the military sniper, and they're going to apply it in their program. Um, so I think that my, my answer to that question is it's coming from everywhere. And I think this damn phone is probably one of the reasons, the Internet, you can get up there and ask someone a question from anywhere in the world, yeah. mm -hmm. and then they'll give you an answer. Um, its question is who can keep up. Yeah. So what's your crystal ball say? What do you guys see in the next five years, ten years? Uh, I, I'm not even going there. Well, <laughs> at least in the next couple <laughs> years, I think we'll still have guns for a couple years. At least three. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we should be good to go there. But I, I think, I think my, my opinion is we're going to see more innovation in some of these ballistic programs that make them more user-friendly with what, what a hunter's trying to do. Because a lot of these programs, you think, oh, this is awesome, but then you get out in the woods in Alaska, it, and your phone ain't going to work or whatever. I mean, what, you know, what is that next innovation on that side? I think what you guys are doing is obviously innovating smaller, lighter, faster. Well, how do we make that scope any lighter than it is? Right now we go, well, it's not possible. Right now it's not, but right. you talk to Vicky. I mean, Vicky Peters and I have been <laughs> good buddies for as long as I can remember. Yeah. And we just look at each other like, if we could have done this 20 years ago when we met, think how many more bad guys we would have killed well, on look the look at the spectrum, the, yeah. the 3 to 6 to 18. They said it couldn't be done. Y'all did it. And y'all are, but you guys aren't stopping that. You, you're continuing to improve that spectrum. It's done. There's nothing, it's, it's, it's working great. Yeah. And everyone's like, damn, they got, you know, and everyone dogged you out at first. I remember five years ago, ah, it's not going to work. It's too small. It's not going to work. Look at it now. Yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with it. It's clear. It focuses. Well, that means, like, because you've, you've probably had one and been shooting one longer than anybody. Oh, that's, that's my know? baby. Yeah. And so you're saying I'm not going to get it back. Oh, no. You knew <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you right no. now, the rest of us sometimes hate you for that. <laughs> hey, I want to see this scope. No, Buck's got it. And six hey. months later, that's the same answer, I guess. You wouldn't want it back right now. Yeah. You don't want that thing back. No, that, that's been the great thing. You don't know where it's been. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't yeah want that absolutely. Thing back. But that, that's what's been so great about it is, you know, it's, we'll, we'll, we'd send one out and all of a sudden I'd, I'd get a text. And I'd get up, we'd get on the phone and, uh, you know, we'd sit there talking for half hour, an hour, and, okay, what do you like, what don't you like, and what's it doing, and, and what do we need to fix? And, you know, it, it, it never happens as fast as I want it to as a product oh, no, manager. No. But, uh, you know, we were able to take all that input, you know, and you, just, you know what it's like. Yeah. You know, you, well, you exciting. It, it, yeah. When, when, you, when you say, hey, you know, you know, Kyle has a brand new muscle car. I say, hey, you know, I like it, but I don't, the rims are kind of, I don't know, and I don't know the throttle. But Kyle ain't going to get mad at you. He's like, okay, okay, Buck, come back in a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you come back, it's like, oh, damn, you really got after the rims, and I like the throttle now. And that's the nice thing. I can, I could be critical. And that's what I am. I'm being critical about a product. I'm not saying, hey, the crap doesn't work. I'm being critical. Mm -hmm. and, then when, and it's nice to see when you come back and say, okay, Buck, I went after that, and I, this is what I did with it. I'm like, wow, you really took time to go after it. And that's the one thing about Leupold I love so much is that you'll take the criticism from the end user, and if it's possible, you'll address it. And if it's not possible, you'll tell you why you're not going to address it. Yeah. And when you say, hey, Buck, in layman's terms, the technology or whatnot, we're still working on it, but it's not there yet, I can, I can appreciate it. I can live with that. I'll keep on doing what i got to do. But, but then when you come. And just you, simple things, though, like the three revolutions of elevation. Yeah. yeah. Duh. I mean, we, that's something that people might not look at that as innovation, but that's, that's innovation. You know what I mean? 
Well, that that is you know, we we've done some stuff with the scopes. You know, we went to uh, you know 35 long with the long range being the craze. Everybody wants to be able to dial farther <laughs> and, and get more travel out of the scope. You know, so we did some things that that people hadn't been thinking of before. We did go to a 35 millimeter main, yep. main tube, which we had in the Mark 8. Um, you know, with the five, it just it gives us more room to move that erector assembly. Um, we also changed some stuff uh, with the erector itself and then, then the shape of that main tube also so we can get more tilt. Yeah. And the great thing with the fives is you get all that tilt and you get all that travel. You know, that, that 30 mils on the dial is awesome, but uh, the image doesn't drop off either when you get that thing cranked right. way up or way down. And that's, that's, um, I'm, I'm even amazed by how clear that thing stays when you, you've got 25 mils dialed on. I and mean, 25 mils will get you a long ways, especially right. with some of the new fast stuff like the Creed Moors and the, the oh, 260s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... It, the, the sky's the limit, basically, at this point. But uh, I think the you know we were talking about where the innovation is going. I think also in projectiles because the I killed that elk a couple weeks ago. The six millimeter Creed mm -hmm. more, you know, that's something that I haven't really been tracking because I really like the six five. But when you shoot that six millimeter out to thousand eleven hundred yards, it's I mean it's like a laser, right? And it's really a souped up two forty three. But they can't you know Sammy Specs doesn't allow for the heavy bullets in a right. two forty three. So here you got a gun that's light recoil. It's dominating PRS. It's available from you know manufacturers Hornady whoever. I don't know. It's just it's hard. I used to reload a lot. Man, mm -hmm. I don't reload at all oh, anymore. Yeah. I can just get <laughs> ammo and it, roll it's, with it. It's funny because those increases in, in the bullets and the technology in the bullets, I think, is what's driving the rest of it, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the capability and the accuracy they're able to get out of those things, it's, it's almost like a, a guided missile now, not necessarily you know, a chunk of copper and lead going down the road. One of the innovations that I thought was kind of fun was that radar that Hornady used. They use oh. a Doppler radar to track their bullets. Right. It's not like scientifically we're saying here's what's going to happen. Going back to what Buck does, Buck, Buck and I are both not science dudes. We're shooter guys that want to see, hey, you can tell me whatever your phone says. Guess what? I'm going to get on the gun, and I'm going to shoot right. it, and I'm going to tell you what really happens. Right. And that's what they did with that radar, which in turn now we have better dope. It's not some mm -hmm. guy doing his you know, Einstein right project there it's actually those guys telling us where that bullet's going to fly so i think that's a big innovation mm -hmm. too i got a lab radar now so i've got a doppler radar on my range nice it's this big problem is it doesn't work with 556 five, bullets real well so i don't know what to do there but maybe i'm doing it wrong i don't know but i think 10 years ago if you said you're going to have your own radar on your range i would have said there's no way even like i said the, i think the ballistic uh, software that's that it's that, that right there is constantly, constantly improving. And uh, I think that is going it's to, building, it's building confidence for the shooters. So maybe 15 years ago, if you would have said 6 millimeter, 6.5, 260 and everything, they would have been like, ah, that's cool, but a little intimidating because now they've got to read this big-ass book by some, you know, ballistician that with big old words. So, well, I'm not going to spend the money or time. But now when you have, you know, a Kestrel with AB software in there and you go through it like, Okay, I zero it. It tells me to shoot this far or true to gun and spits out your data. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a wrap. Oh, and also, by the way, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change as I go in a different atmospherics. Density altitude change, all that good stuff. So when you have that, it invites a person to say, okay, I can take all this information and apply it and learn it very quickly. Um, so bring the new, bullet, new bullet that comes out. I'm, I'm good to go. I'm going right. to call a company or whoever I'm working yeah. with, and I can inject that new soft, uh, new uh, information about that bullet in my gun, and I can shoot it. Then you have your ARR companies. A lot of these bullets are coming, and they're in the, your your 308 variant uh, AR platform. Well, computers will let CNC machines dial everything down. So now, if you know, Kyle wants to make a, a gun in the six mm, it's, it's easy, mm -hmm. relatively speaking, if he's got the cash to yeah, do yeah. it. So they can do that. So it's just no longer a pipe dream to have that bullet and a gun that works well. If you can do it, right. and it's not that hard. So I think a lot of your innovation with software, bullets, guns, and then, you know, scopes, it's just, it's just um, they're feeding off each other. Yep. That, that's what's been fun for me as the, as the scope guy is, is the capabilities of the, of the rifles and the bullets. And <coughs> now with, um, you know, guys like you that are out there doing trainings it's in, in the internet it's easier for people to get information to, to learn how to do things so the shooters are getting better the bullets are more accurate right. the rifles are more accurate and and that's driven us to try and improve our capabilities because you know years ago if you told me you're going to shoot a 308 to 1200 yards and be able to hit a 24 inch plate nine out of ten times 
you know, I would have just laughed at you. Right. Um, but now it's like the the technology in the projectile and the launching platform is there. The skills of the shooters are getting better, and that's driving us to find ways to make sure that 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 bullet's going to go exactly where you want it to every time at whatever distance you want to shoot it. And you know the tracking. Um, you know it's one of the things we spent a lot of time on with uh, with the new scopes uh, was making sure that that the adjustments. If if you spin on that dial, that bullet's going to go exactly right. where it's supposed when to you, go. When you when you pull that scope out, that Mark V, and you click it, it's like whoa. Yeah, there's a sting. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. No, it's, <laughs> it's funny. I never really realized that you start going back and forth, and my youngest was doing it. It's like, wow, this is kind of loud. I'm like, what are you talking about loud? She, and she, what she was talking about she, the spring tan or whatever. I'm not gonna get into detail, but it's it's, it's distinct. Mm -hmm. And after a while, you're like, dang, I don't turn knobs, but I'm gonna turn this one for a little bit because it oh, sounds yeah, feels yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Tack, tack, tack. yeah. But um, everything on there. I think I think you know, I have a saying: if, if it looks good, nine times out of ten, it's probably gonna run and work pretty good. But that's good. The scope, when you look at it, looks nice. Yeah, it looks nice. I, everything about it looks it's streamlined. It, I mean, it just um, the cosmetics of it, and like you said, cosmetics ain't gonna win a battle. But again, at time, if you win and you look good doing it, then damn, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it makes for a good picture. But the scope looks good. Um, it feels good. Uh, like I said, it, it just um, you guys did a good job. Not only in internals, that obviously that's an important part, but the outside of it looks good too. Well, I, I'm just, I mean, I'm glad you like the looks of it too, because that it's it's function drives form, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I spent a lot of time on the range with Kyle talking about you know how we how we get things to to work together and work with the shooter, and that's that's one of the things I think was missing in the past. A lot of times, you know, you could go out and you design a scope, and it was kind of designed in a vacuum where it's a great scope as a scope sitting here on right. the desk. But uh, so we went back and it's like, well, but we don't use these things sitting on the desk. We put them on guns. Right. And then that's where Buck and I had a lot of the conversations and you and I have had conversations in the past, like working on well, the LCO and stuff like that. Well, we've had engineers, you know, Schwen and, and mm -hmm. some of the guys coming out and standing on the range beside me as I'm, we were working on the LCO, right. the Devo, and it's, it's nice for guys like us when they actually listen to our feedback. And yep. he's taking notes and six weeks later, We've got another scope to look at that has those changes, and you know this isn't uh, this isn't the first scope that you guys have done that you've had success with. It's the VX6 series, which I actually shoot more of than I do mm -hmm. the uh, the Mark VI or the Mark V. I shoot that because I hunt a lot, and some of the simple innovations, you know, the new coatings and all that. I get it, rain sloughs off. Zero lock turrets. That's awesome because yep. if I'm putting them on a horse and uh, riding up the side of a hill or on a side-by-side -side, or I do some running down jackrabbits with snow machines and we have a, a gun case on the front of the snow, uh, snow machine, if you have exposed turrets, you're, you're never going to hit what you're shooting at because they're mm -hmm. going to be off. The other thing that we've done, uh, that little index line at half power. Yeah. Most... I, I don't think most people even know what that's for, but the reason that was put there was because if you're shooting an MOA or a mill reticle, you go to half power, now it's twice twice that effect. We got a hunting scope. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's cheap. Well, it's not cheap. <laughs> that's the wrong term. It's not as expensive as they used to be. Right. And you can have a 2 to 12, a 3 to 18, have a small package, go to half power, still be able to use it. I mean, it's there's so much innovation there. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, if I was a military sniper... I would have been happy back when I was going through sniper school. No. If they would have given me a VX6, I would have been the man with yeah. that thing. Now we've got stuff that's way beyond that with the Mark V. But, uh, man, that VX6 is a great series. The, the uh, VX5, I took some of those scopes to uh, Africa and some other places and have shot a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. with them. And Impact reticle, you know, and that's a good example of how the civilian side has, I believe, impacted – the military side, the or I'm sorry, the military side impact the civilian side, that impact reticle. Now I've got the same reticle in my spotter as I do in my scope, and right. it's not made for a military guy, it's made for a yeah. civilian. That reticle's awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great reticle. Yeah. Now, so. um, it's funny when you say that, it, and I'll kind of question to Kyle's as a class, the demographic, demographic of uh, client, the shooters that come in. It, I would say in the last four years, Probably in the last two years, it's it's it's, it's changed, and um, and and I say it's just it's more diverse. Mm -hmm. I'm getting 
But before, it's mostly just, you know, tattoo gun enthusiasts. I'm getting doctors. I'm getting, uh, I mean, I mean, tactical shit. They want to get into tactical stuff. Doctors. Um, a lot of females. Moms. And it, at first it was kind of funny, but now, but when you see a, a mom coming out, and she's got a, a 3 to 18 with a whore, trimmer 3 on her. Yeah, do not scope. piss her I'm off. A, I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. Her husband didn't come. It's just her. Um, not that she couldn't, but, okay, what brought her to want to jump in this rabbit hole? Buck Doyle brought her to the well, range, bro. That's I what like, brought her to the I like to, to think range. so, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't blush that easy. <laughs> but um, but it's just, it's, it's the demographic is changing. I am not going to second-guess Anyone who shows up, at you know, class. to add it's to that, I think that it's the, it's we're getting more of the total package too. We're getting people that are the doctor or the lawyer or uh, the blue collar guy. I had a guy that was a mechanic. That's what he does every day. He goes and he wrenches on cars, you know, like at a, a GMC or whatever, and he loves to shoot this stuff. And he's doing CrossFit yeah. and working out so that he is in shape, good enough to go hunt, but he wants to come take a tactical class because it's going to help him with his hunting. <laughs> and every day he gets up and he goes and he wrenches on vehicles, which he loves because he likes to solve that problem. That A few years ago, that wasn't the guy yeah. that was going to show up to our classes. No. And I, man, I love it. I think it's, I think it's great. We had, you know, we've had guys that uh, we just have, we have awesome students that no, show up. I think that's a, big, that's a big push, too, now is for – it's just, you know, when you have the, the, the diverse shooter out there in the, in the United States now, it's just not true. Right. It's, it's more mainstream than it, it ever it, has it, been It the very past. is. And, pe- and people don't give that enough. Um, it, oh, I don't, as, a, as, a, as an instructor, I don't give enough credit to the American people on what they want to do for a hobby. And um, it's just especially age limits. I got, I got a six-year-old retired concrete guy, made the successful, successful. Came to the first class. He comes to every doggone class I have first class he was out of shape and everything else and every class you just see this transformation that like you said he is working out he's doing what he can because mm-hmm. he knows those positions aren't easy yeah. at 62 years old right but he wants to do it um i got hunters that come out and go you know what i've been hunting my whole life and my game is not where it's supposed to be because i was shooting in deer stands in texas but now i'm going overseas and i got i gotta hump mountains and i'm taking shots and taking that shot, yeah, I got a clear shot of 500, but there's a big ravine down there. I'm not going down there to get that, that so I'm going to track it a little longer. So the education's out there, but then you have that hunt, uh, hunter that understands, like, well, you know what? I got to be in shape now. I got to be able to understand what the weather's going to do because they're going to different places. I, I think <laughs> also the other big thing for the long-range hunters, and I, me personally, I'm not a fan of long-range hunting. I'm a fan of you shooting as long as your capabilities allow. It should always so be for case, me, yeah. I mean, I, I shot a, 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 a doll sheep at 728 yards. If it wouldn't have been the last day of the hunt, I would have not taken that shot. Sure. So I was a little desperate. I'd shot that gun beyond that distance. I felt like mm, maybe, maybe I can make this shot. I missed right. with my first shot and then rolled him off the hill in the second shot. Very lucky that that happened. But I think that if a shooter comes to your class or to my class, what we're trying to accomplish for the long-range hunter is not that you are going to come out and shoot in my class out to 1,200 yards and then go out and shoot an elk at 1,200 yards. I want you to come to my class and shoot out to 1,200 yards, and then you go hunting, and an elk jumps up at 450 or 500 yards, and you know you have the confidence to make a 100% kill shot on that animal. Because, hey, here's here's a surprise for you folks out there. 450 yards is a long freaking way, <laughs> no, man. Is. Yeah. It is. It is. And, and the thing is, and, and I totally agree with Kyle saying, um, and I used to think a long time ago that, you know, taking a, a long shots past 1,000 on a, a deer or an elk, that's too far. But then, again, innovation came up and bit me in the ass. Mm-hmm. You have the root rounds now. You know, you have uh, bullets like uh, uh, 300 Norma, you know, yeah. that hybrid. I mean, that bullet – goes fast for a long time right. and it's still doing his job on impact um i got a buddy who all he does is he takes a thousand to 1500 meter shot over and oh that's all he does why because the places he goes that may be the shot is he going out there to go i'm gonna sit here until not necessarily but if that's a shot he knows his capabilities yeah mm-hmm. 
He shoots it in inclement weather. He's doing all those things. But again, the reticles that have come out now give you all the information on winds. He's had to learn about catabatic and orographic winds, all those different things. Now, again, like you said, you got to be a smart person. Do I take the shot? What a second, third effects taking that shot? Yeah. 1,500 meters. I don't care if you're in a car. That's a long-ass drive. You'll get, you'll pick yeah, up. Yeah, trying that to get there. If you shoot a, an so, elk yeah. as the sun's going down, and are you going to find that elk and save the meat? Right. You know. But when he says, "Hey, we got a, we got a helicopter on standby and everything," okay, all these things now seem to be feasible. Mm -hmm. But you can't. Bro's take got the a shot. helicopter on standby. Hey. I want to hunt with that guy. Hey, I tell you that what, that sounds like New Zealand. Some of the people man, that come that's out, awesome. yeah, yeah, they they'll, they'll slow roll in. They got a little little car and everything like that. But then when you see the pictures and what they're doing, they're spending their money on other stuff. You know? Oh yeah, but um, hey, uh, go ahead. What so, about uh, what about binos? Have you shot the or used the the fifteen powers? No, I have not. No. Oh my goodness! So, so the, you just got me in trouble, Kyle. Thanks. Oh, sorry, it's bro. Like, it's all right. <laughs> you got <laughs> your Buck's, scope out there doing your thing. As soon as you ask that question, Buck looks at me. And goes, I have a few no. questions, Kyle. At, yeah. the, at the end, of the <laughs> no, summer. no, I have not. It's like, <laughs> so we took sorry. those Sanium fifteen <laughs> powers, and they're they're unbelievable. They're awesome. So I put them on a tripod, and I've got this little lightweight um, carbon fiber Gitzo tripod, and it's got that outdoorsman head, you know, mm -hmm. so I can pop a spotter on there. Well, I figured out how to spot pop those on it. They make an adapter for that thing. Right. Pop that on there. But I mean, both eyes open, none of that, and i got to stare through. Now, I'm not saying a spotter is not a good tool. Oh, send it. Yeah, but yeah. when you're out there hunting – and you don't want to carry all this extra crap up the side of a hill. I mean, I might still want to carry a smaller set just for close stuff, but I could get away with just those. You got to see those things, dude. You you want to talk about seeing? Tri uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, if you get choked out, sorry, bro. <laughs> yeah. No, hey, no, but but calling calling Trace and reading Mirage with them. Oh my goodness, that hunt. We were out hunting with this this cat, uh, John Burns, that runs Wyoming Arms. He took him. He's like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, and he shoots. He's always shooting long-range AR stuff. And he had a guy from the Wyoming governor's office, uh, Nephi Cole. That's the first time I got to stretch him out. I live in, in uh, Nashville. So, you know, stretching out 300 yards, that's about as far as we can get anywhere uh, out there. We were shooting 11, 1,200 yards and being able to oh, – they're unbelievable. Well, to man. your point, for, so I've got – Lightweight. Really? The, the little bit I've got to play with them because they – you know, I pretty much just stay locked in the basement most of the time. But uh, <laughs> talking about, you know, being able to see Trace and Mirage, they're, they are awesome. They're 15 by 56. They're, they're pretty lightweight for the size of binocular they are. You know, they, they retail at 1400 bucks, so they're, they're, they're affordable. But like, for you guys on the range and, and you know, getting that information and, and getting the feedback, Trace is awesome through them. Really? Uh, Mirage right. is awesome. So, so you don't get that. You know how when you're, you're doing a lot of glassing or right. spotting in your classes, no matter how you do that, your eyes get jacked up. Sure. With these, you just don't get it. You know, here's what we got to do, though. Maybe I shouldn't even say this on the podcast, but I'm going to say it because I'm going to hold you to it. Because if it's on the podcast, you got to do it. <laughs> Once it's out there, you, you can't bring it back. Recorded information. I, <laughs> I want a reticle in that. Those. Oh, here we go. If we had a reticle in those things, dude. Especially if you're saying you can mount them. On, on a tripod. Yeah, you can mount a tripod. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 the great thing, so the bino actually comes. It's got a, a little tray that, that fits the profile of the binoculars. We've got a Velcro strap, but sure. it's set up to mount right onto a tripod adapter. So they, they come from us. You, you pull it out of the package. It's got the tripod mount in there with the binos. So you See, and that get, says mobile about yeah. it, so yeah, especially yeah. if you're talking about the small package it is. Mm -hmm. Spotters are nice, but, again, if you're going to be mobile, pack and everything yeah, else. Yeah, the, the, I use the outdoorsman one because it, it's just a stiff piece that attaches and you can quickly put it on and off. When I used the Velcro one, it tended to kind of pull the binos together a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Maybe my eyes are too far apart. I don't hey. know. <laughs> but, uh, no judgments here. You know, um, <laughs> helps me see around corners. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're, if you put a reticle in those bad boys, that, that's going to be – I mean, I literally would not take a spotter on most of my hunting unless I'm going somewhere on a horse or in a vehicle or floating down a river. Then I could take my spotter. You know, there's still spotter still is, is king for that, especially if you're hunting doll sheep or something. But for, for what we're doing, if you're sure. trying to pe teach people to, one, do PRS stuff, hunting at, at mid-ranges or hunting people, oh, they're awesome. 
So sorry about that, dude. Oh, you no, gotta no, get no. Some. It's, it's you got to get some. Don't say sorry to me. Say sorry to John. He's got <laughs> to deal with it. I, I, think, I think he's just trying to throw me under the bus because I admitted that you got the, the Mark V first. See, he didn't tell me that. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm sending a few out there. And, you know, yeah, yeah. He didn't say you're, you're getting only one. Yeah, um, I have a I hate Buck Doyle picture <laughs> up on my <laughs> wall at home. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, th- I, I want to uh, say one other thing, too, about this stuff that, that we do. When we do stuff with Leupold as guys in the industry, I think that's what's really been cool with, uh, you know, and I don't, I don't know Buck real well, but I know his reputation, and I know the other guys that we have on our team, and that's, you know, Sean, I, I think Sean's here somewhere. Um, these guys are beyond reproach that Absolutely. we have on our team. And they're out there doing the right thing. They're not just saying, hey, it's my way or the highway. You're looking at everybody. I don't right. care what a guy brings to a class because I look at it this way. Either he was issued that or he bought it with his own money. If he was issued that, it's what he has to use. Right. If he bought it with his own money, I'm not going to say you're stupid. Let's figure out how to make it work with sure. what you got. That being said, we can then try to show them some other tools to make it happen. But, you know, we're really lucky to have guys like you, uh, you know, paint it red. My buddy Sean is, is – uh, <laughs> Sean Weissman, another former Army guy. We uh, and of course we got the professional shooters and even the guys that are hunters out there figuring out what works for them. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know Trent Eichler. Fred's I don't know. I don't know. Tr- I have not met his son. Uh, hmm. So I got to tell a war story about him real quick. So this little kid, I think he just turned 13. He killed his first bear when he was 12. Wow. He was shooting the other day and he was shooting these plates out to 600 yards. And the guy that was there, I wasn't there when this happened. The guy goes, hey, uh, what are your holds on those plates? What, how much, you know, you, you, you got like hash mark? What do you got? And he goes, what are you talking about? No, I got a duplex reticle in my scope. Shooting 5.56 five, out to 600 yards and with an AR, obviously. And uh, Fred's there with him, his dad, who's a, just a great dude, good friend of mine, and just a wild man. This guy said, let me see that. He, he took six shots and hit set those six targets, 13 years old. Nice. So looks through the scope, and all it is is a duplex reticle. He knows how high to hold above a target at 600 yards. So the point I want to make with that is he doesn't know anything other than the range because he can see on there it says 600 yards sure. on, the, on the range markers. But he's actually went out and shot it. He, d- he didn't. <coughs> He's not dialing anything. He doesn't know what the dope is. He can look at that, and he knows the reference. And we need more people like that getting out on the range and actually mm-hmm. shooting and missing and figure out where it's at so right. that now when they are in a situation, if, if that kid knows the distance, he's going to kill it. Well, that's, so that's the great thing about hearing you guys talk about the diversity of the people that are coming through your classes right. and, you know, the, the broad spectrum of backgrounds and experiences because, um, like, what I saw, you know, the, the Mark V is an awesome scope. A lot of a lot of what's gone into the Mark V, it was all about, you know, how does it, how does the scope work with the shooter? How do we make it as easy to use as possible when you're behind the gun? Um, a lot of that started from the LRP project, where you know yeah, we, we were working on some stuff, and you know, with, with my experiences, um, you know, getting my girlfriend out, she wanted to go shooting with me, and so we're out there, and and, and I'm. I start rattling stuff off like I would with with one of you guys who knows what I'm talking about, and she's she just gives me this look. And it's like, well okay, we got to go back to basics, you know? And so that's, that's not only did we go back to basics with, with getting her on the range and getting her out shooting, but it was also was like, okay, so I got to go back to basics with the product too, right? Like how do we, how do we make this as simple to use for, for the end user? How do we make it as, as comfortable to use when it's actually on the gun, not, you know, not just right. out there in, in design yeah. land, but on the gun, you know, everything's, everything's as ergonomic as possible. If, if, it, if you don't need it, we got rid of it. We made the numbers bigger. And a lot of it went back to that. You know, it's, I, I had to reset myself and my expectations and, and just go back to basics with the product design. And, um, and, and to your point, Kyle, just getting people out there shooting. Hearing, hearing your stories about the, the people that are coming to your classes and, and they're, you know, they're getting out there and they're doing it and they're learning it. And that's, you know, that drives me and it drives our innovation. Right. Because they're, they're going to come back to us with, with questions. And, and sometimes. Yeah, and that's the whole thing is like military. Yep. Uh, we kill ourselves because we, we, uh, we keep everything, all the information in one little fishbowl and we, we pat each other on the back. Oh, that's good. Cool. No, one's, no one's coming outside looking at it and saying, ah. That's, that needs to be worked on, or you need to look at that, or why are you doing this? Mm-hmm. And uh, that's why I see when, I, when people come to class, I learn just as much as they do. Right. Um, in the sense that the way they, they, they perceive a target, 
What does it look like? How are they holding on the target? The verbiage they may use. Because you know as well as I do, if you got ten people online, they might they may not take the <laughs> same word the same way, you know. So it's not the military where everyone's gonna learn just no, you know. So um, you learn a lot about um, how people perceive shooting, mm-hmm. what they like about shooting, and um, it, it, fifteen years ago I wouldn't entertained it, but now I do because I mean I want to teach, and I'm not teaching military guys anymore. I'm teaching everyone. Right. So you have to understand what makes them tick, what, what, what's, uh, what's comfortable, what's uncomfortable, uh, and, and not get so bent out of shape when it's not done the same way you've seen for the last, you know, two decades. Mm-hmm. You know, someone may straddle a rock and shoot differently than we did. Are the fundamentals being applied? Yes. Is it safe? Yes. Continue. Right. Yeah, one of the things I see, like, the, you know, one of the <laughs> See a lot of long range shooters lay straight oh behind the gun. You got to be straight behind the gun, and I go, okay. So you want to be straight behind the gun, but I want to shoot that target, and then this target to the right, and then I'm going to shoot this target to the left, and you can't do that when you're straight behind the gun. So I look for a straight spine versus. So it's good, you know, if there's a guy out there that teaches that, I'm fine with that. But think about if you get straight behind a gun and you're in a hunting situation, you lay there for two hours. <laughs> I laid on a rock in <laughs> Africa for like seven hours in baboon crap, left-handed because I couldn't get in this position, left-handed, and finally this kudu stands up and I'm able to shoot it. If I would have had a straight position in an uncomfortable position, I would have been all jacked up and, you know, shaking and moaning about that, but I'm just laying there. That goes back to the whole thing, understanding the fundamentals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yes, ideally. Scientifically, ergonomically, if you're straight behind the gun, you'll manage recoil and do all that great stuff perfectly. However, comma, if you're not on a groomed range, yeah, mm-hmm. if you're out in the real world, you're never going to have that. Yeah. So, understanding the fundamentals and what gives you the best shot and dealing with what you got and doing your best to apply those things mm-hmm. are two different things. Oh, and yeah. that's what makes a good instructor. Because you know, you could you get a guy with a back problem, you can say it all you want. It's not happening, instructor. Yeah. So what are you going to do about it? What are you, how yeah, are you going to yeah. get him on target? Well, we're going to sacrifice a little bit of this, get you on air, and we're going to work with that. Oh, you know what? That's a that non-fired hand. It can compensate what we can't get back here. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just looking at it, and that's what I'm really loving about you know, 47 years old now, teaching is I'm learning how to take another avenue approach and helping someone out right. shooting. Yeah. And it's just that. Just when we first started. Uh, well, not first started, but I was in the unit and I was doing things and I realized that I never shot from the support side. Uh, now we're shooting, you know, we're shooting the guns right hand, left hand. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. We don't even think about it. And these no. new guys that are coming on board, these young Marines, young Army guys, you know, I guess the Navy, they got some people that shoot guns. I think so. Yeah. I've heard. <laughs> uh, Air Force guys, they, man, they don't even think about it. You know, it's just it's just something we do. And having a scope that allows you to do that, having a weapon system that allows that. The stock works left or right-handed. I mean, mm-hmm. it all works together, and I don't know. We there's. I'm excited to see what happens because I never would have thought you would have had that. When I, I first saw that scope, I was like, oh, my goodness. There you go. So, anyway. Yeah. Well, ho- hopefully we got some surprises in store for you. Yeah. Keep them coming. Absolutely. Please. Absolutely. Well, looks like uh, we're, we're starting to get close to the end of our time here, so um, – and anything you guys want to want to throw in on the tail end of this? No, I just, uh, it's been. A, I mean, I've heard of and won't follow Kyle. I mean, he's a little older than me, not too much, but um, I, it's good to be Come here. Come on now, with him. look hey. at this face. Hey, <laughs> 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 but no, he he did uh, he did pave a lot of uh, great things for me to retire and he, and he come into this world, his mm-hmm. world, and actually teach. And I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, like I said, I just I just I'm looking forward to. What else you guys are going to come out? And I hope that Mark V family continues to grow. Oh, yeah. It's, other it's, size it's getting bigger. Yeah, good to go. Yep. Good to go. Well, yeah, same thing with Buck. I mean, we I know his reputation. We're not old <coughs> drinking buddies or anything like that. But when you hear what guys are doing, you, you kind of look back and you go, now what's this guy doing? Because sometimes I hear what people do and I'm like, well, that's just stupid or that's unsafe. <laughs> I hear what he's doing and I'm like, Man, I want to cancel one of my classes so I can get in his class. Oh, anytime, you know. I mean, that's the that, and that's why having a guy on the team with uh, I've been with Loophole a long time, yes. and a lot of people want to be on this team because you guys are doing a lot of cool stuff. Well, this is the right guy. 
Uh, Sean's the right guy. A lot of those other competition shooters you got there, the right people. And, uh, man, you got the right folks at the at the, at the the uh, office. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a privilege too. and an honor for me because, I mean, not only get to work with you guys just to collaborate on the product and stuff like that, but to, to gain that knowledge and, and the, the differences that, that you have from what you see going through your training classes, the information you bring back to us and, and what Buck sees in his and the information that comes back from him. Like, I, I've got the best team in the world between the engineers and the designers and all that stuff, but, but also you two and, and the Sean's of the world. Yeah, and, giving us access. It gives us, you know, we have the access to some of these young Marines and, and young Army dudes that can also tell us more what they need because right. sometimes we just don't know. I mean, right. I, I try to think outside the box, but, man, they come up with stuff. Anyway, well, yeah. yeah, thanks for having us. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys doing the podcast with us, and, uh, you know, I appreciate – everything the, the years of collaboration and the information and can't thank you guys enough awesome. i hope you live to be as old as me buck <laughs> <laughs> crazy <laughs>